there it there it oh, goes. this is Pastor Larson. I'm inviting you to consider the question regarding the Lord's Supper. When you come to the Lord's table, do questions sometimes arise in your mind? How might we examine ourselves before receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper? I'm Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida inviting you to our worship at 8.30 and 10.30 at 400 North Swinton Avenue in Delray Beach. And I invite you to our Bible study, and that's where we are now. What does the Bible say about the Lord's Supper? What does the Bible say about the Lord's Supper? On the night in which he was betrayed, we're using that as kind of an intro sentence because that is what was going on when the Lord with his 12 apostles was celebrating the Passover. Now we've talked about that already, so I'm not going back to that. Uh, today, we have some other questions before us regarding the Lord's Supper. And I want you to join with us, even if those aren't your questions, because you know what? They might become your question someday. Uh, I want you to understand that I'm not raising these questions to get you to wonder, but to get you to have some confidence. And pardon me, I had to fix something. Uh, okay. On the night in which he was betrayed. Do you have any questions about the Lord's Supper? I didn't start with answers. I'm starting again with your questions. Well, if they come up during our study, I invite them at any time. As I said before, just jump in and uh, will it entertain any question about anything about the Lord's Supper at any time. The Lord's Supper, what's a proper reception of the Lord's Supper? Have you ever thought about that? I, I think you probably have. Because when you realize it is the Sunday on which we are celebrating it in the church, in the sanctuary, or when you have an occasion when you're ill to receive it privately, What's the proper reception of the Lord's Supper? What does St. Paul really mean when he says, let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup? Examine. So here are the things that I'd like to cover, if not in this session, in the one that follows, a proper reception of the Lord's Supper, this question of St. Paul regarding a self-examination. Now that is not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but only in the 11th chapter of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, self-examination. And then I think you have probably thought about worthiness. Who is worthy? to receive the Lord's Supper? And that is the question that St. Paul also raises in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, I don't want you to doubt, but in this session or perhaps next time, I would like us to talk about the doubts that sometimes arise in people's minds and in their hearts. And then, I want to end with the assurance, with those wonderful words of Jesus for you, given and shed for you, because this addresses each person individually, okay? So let's take a look at that reception. How should I examine myself before going to the supper of the Lord? I think you probably have some answers you want to share any of those right away? Examine yourself. Anybody? Quiet reflection. 
quiet reflection. Good. Um, I think we we look at um, how we've been living our life. Have we com committed any sins um, okay. that we need to be uh, repentant of? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good. Good examination. What else? We have to believe that the bread and wine are the body and blood of Jesus. Right? Jesus, Jesus says this is so. That makes it so. Yeah. All right. That we're thankful that we can even do it. I think Thanksgiving is so much a part of it that from early centuries on, it has been called the Eucharist. Do you remember why we said it was called the Eucharist? Because the word Eucharist is from the Greek meaning to give thanks or Thanksgiving. Every day is a day of Eucharist, <laughs> but capital E, Eucharist, has been used to talk about the sacrament, even though the Bible never calls it the Eucharist. Now, why is it called the Eucharist? Because when he blessed the bread, he gave thanks. Okay. Mm. All right. So that's why the church has called it the Eucharist. Well, how should I examine myself? And according to what standard? Well, the passage that governs this is 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29, and it covers two slides. Judy, uh, are you up for a, the opening sure. Bible passage? Sure. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Next slide. Whoever therefore eats the bread uh -oh. and drinks Pardon. the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Thank you. Now, in these um, verses, uh, seven verses from 1 Corinthians 11, there is a lot to study. And we're not going to take it all at once. We're going to look at various parts of this long passage, which St. Paul received from the Lord Jesus how, where, and when, we don't know. When you read this and compare it with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find that what St. Paul appears to have is a compilation of everything that occurs there, plus some other things that he received from Jesus. So in one way of speaking, it's a more fuller, that's not a very good comparison. It is a, uh, a complete recitation of the Lord's will concerning the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. Well, you can study that for yourself in your own Bible and take it slowly, a phrase or a word at a time. But I want to go on and ask you, what does it mean to receive the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? What does that mean? St. Paul writes, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Now, nobody would want to knowingly do that. So before you get 
feeling all guilty and ask, is it I, Lord? Have I done this? Uh, let's talk about this. And as again, though you may have this, you know, in your catechism learning from 50 years or more ago, uh, some people have not studied this in detail. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this, to go in a little deeper. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So verse 29 is a bit of a commentary on the unworthy manner of verse 27. You see that? Mm -hmm. If you're not discerning the body. Now, much ink has been spilled and printed on the internet regarding the meanings of these words. And I am not one to seek controversy. I'm looking at the context. And the context here has to do with the body and blood of the Lord. The context has to do with the bread and the cup, that is the cup of wine. So uh, let's look at those together and talk about people uh, who could, might, or are worried about receiving uh, the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Have you ever wondered about that? Have you ever said, is it I? I have, and, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because I, I really didn't know what you're teaching us today. I mean, and to an extent, not that I, I meant to be. No, but it was ignorance. I mean, you didn't have it in depth. It was Evelyn that showed me, told me, or actually uh, coerced me to <laughs> be quiet and um, reflect. And I love her for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Well, we all become teachers of one another. Uh, when and, and I love that, that you have a fellowship with one another and a, and a feeling or a knowledge of uh, trust that you're not going to be criticized for asking questions. I think uh, I love Chris's questions. <laughs> they keep me on my toes. I said, oh, I haven't had that one before. So let's talk about the unworthy manner that uh, is in this verse. What does it mean to take the supper in an unworthy manner? I listened to recordings of years ago, and I have read some commentary by a man named Martin Franzman, who was a professor at the St. Louis Seminary for many, many years. And he wrote a lot. He wrote about the Lord's Supper in one place. Part of his commentary on this was put into um, what is called, I think I can hold this up here. This is the Concordia Bible with notes. I don't think I can get it all on the screen. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. And uh, this is a little bit like a precursor to the Lutheran Study Bible. Uh, it's only the New Testament. And what Martin Franzman did is write a running commentary for all 27 books of the New Testament. And when he got to 1 Corinthians 11, he commented on this word unworthiness. And I believe there are four points here. And we'll take them, take them one at a time. Unworthiness lies in not discerning the body in its sanctity and significance. There's something holy going on here. And it's not seen by eyes, but only by faith. You cannot see the Lord's body. You cannot see the Lord's blood. Everyone knows that. And the Lord's body in its significance, that this is the body which was given into death for our sins. That's the sanctity and the significance of the Lord's body present in the supper. It's present in a way that nobody on earth can explain. And the Lord has decided not to try to explain it. Our head is way too small. Our mind is much too limited, but his is not. Mm -hmm. Now, the second point is eating and acting as if 
the present Lord were not present, but had failed to keep his promise. Not only the I am with you promise, which is general and wide in its application, but exactly present and received by all communicants. By all communicants. Remember I said last time, it is not my faith or your faith. It's not the communicants faith that makes the Lord's body present and received. But his word and his promise, this is my body. This is my blood. And don't let the, uh, the prevalence of modern thinking push that away. Only faith receives the blessings of the Lord's Supper. Remember that diagram from last week? The Lord's Supper unworthiness lies also as if his drink of it, all of you, did not bind all of his disciples together. I know, Judas was there too, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a problem for Jesus. It was still possible for Judas to repent, but he did not. No, he didn't weaken. Okay, and fourth, unworthiness is also consists in impenitence. And you mentioned that earlier when you said, I received the Lord's Supper, and on the way, my preparation includes my confession of my sins, the things I know I have committed. And I ask the Lord, forgive me this, and forgive me that too, and I'm sorry. And I want to amend uh, my sinful life. Many years ago, I attended a church where there was a, a card in the pew and it had three statements on it that I could go to the Lord's Supper. And it's the third point was, if I intend to amend my sinful life, if mm -hmm. I don't intend to change, I should just sit there in the pew. And forget it. And, and forget it, for, yeah, and, and not go. We'll talk about abstinence uh, in that case. Uh, but if I'm in, in a state of unbelief, I don't believe the Lord Jesus is my Savior. I don't believe that he can be present in the supper. I, I don't believe this church. Uh, I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in what God has said. When I'm in that place of unbelief, I need to repent of that lack of faith. Any question about these four things? Not discerning the body, acting as though he were not present, not realizing that this binds us together. In fact, the Lord's Supper is it's not so much as a verb as a statement. Let me explain that. The Lord's Supper is not so much of a verb about the body of Christ, but a statement of unity, which is presumed to and is supposed to exist. And that is worthy of two or three books. <laughs> number, number three, um, maybe I'm uh, looking into it. But, you know, when we are at the table, the Lord's table, and, you know, say there's six of us at the, at the railing together as a, as a family, and we take communion, and it says it did not bind all his disciples together. And since in our church we have what is known as an open communion, which is offered um, uh, after pastor explains what communion is, I get, you know, I know we're, we're, what, we're responsible, or we're not responsible, Christ is responsible, it's between him and uh, us as far as our communion, but if somebody is not believing at that table, um, does that then not bind us all together, or, you know, that's, yeah. that's left to the, that's left to the Lord and his judgment? Well, that's really what I'm trying to talk about there. There is a presumption of us, our oneness, but I know and you know that it doesn't always exist. Uh, 
And there is a trust going on here that I believe that the Lord's word has the power to change hearts mm -hmm. and to bring all to the same faith. But when there is an unbelieving person or a doubting person, I don't know of that. The pastor may not, probably does not know of it, or he would have to deal with it. But that person may not even be aware of that person's personal lack of oneness. And that's mm -hmm. where repentance has to take place. So you're right that uh, part of it we have to leave to the Lord because we can't see it, know it, or do anything about it. And at that point, it, it's really a very difficult thing. But uh, I, I am hesitating because when I was a full-time pastor and I was the shepherd responsible for the proper administration of the Lord's Supper in that congregation. I, I was charged with that. It was uh, part of my call to do that. I realized that on a given Sunday morning, there might be one person or two or five that were not with us in all of the senses that you've mentioned and a couple of others. Mm -hmm. Unrepentant hearts come to the table. I know that from experience. So if they don't present themselves to me personally, I can't do anything about that. But I pray. Um, you know, when I was still assisting pastor in the distribution of the Lord's Supper on a Sunday morning, and then at, after bringing uh, the cup to everyone, or I was bringing uh, the wafer more, more likely to my table or the table on the non-pulpit side. Well, anyway, as I was receiving, as I was giving the Lord's Supper, I had an occasion to, to stop and, and just wait for the next table, right? And I stood there. You don't know this. But sometimes, actually quite often, I would pray for each of the members that I saw kneeling there silently. I want I want what the Lord wants. I was gonna say again, we you know, we know God sheds his grace on he wants us he wants to shed his grace on everyone. And the, and the means of grace are the word and the sacraments, mm -hmm. and that is taking place, and he is doing that without human aid. Yeah. My, my mouth speaks the words. My mouth gives the bread and the <laughs> wine. My hands uh, lift up the water uh, onto the child or adult's head. Mm-hmm. But God is doing the work. Mm -hmm. You remember my sentence or my, my saying that I would like to hang three signs <laughs> in the chancel on Sunday morning, one over the baptismal font and one over the pulpit and one uh, and the lectern and one over the supper. And all three signs would say the same thing. God at work. Mm -hmm. Let's go on. Uh, I've already mentioned that this is from the Concordia Bible with notes. So here we have this long passage again with verse 28 underlined, let a person examine himself. We do have to come up with a new pronoun, but given the state of the argument in the nation about pronouns, I'm not going to cover that one this morning. I know better than to get into that. <laughs> let someone whoever that person is examine that person's own person you see how awkward it gets let a person examine himself or herself so here's what saint paul says in first corinthians 11 31 and 32 you may not have ever studied this so let's dive in and see what we can find the lord's spirit inspired these words so you know, they're not given to us to throw away or, or to un, uh, 
unhinge from the Bible. They're here. So St. Paul says, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Huh? But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. To judge yourself has to do with an examination according to some kind of standard. Okay? Self-examination, that which is that which St. Paul speaks about in his examination here in verse 28. That self-examination has to do with testing against some standard. Okay? Let's take the speed limit. If my Oh, if my speedometer says 30 and the sign by the side of the road says 25, I'm examining my speed in accordance with the standard that the village or city or county or state has put there. Now, if I don't judge myself, somebody else is going to judge me if they have, uh, <laughs> if, I, if they have the radar set up, right? Mm-hmm. So I hope you will accept my, my analogy here. When I test myself against a standard, oh, what is that sign by the side of the road? What's the standard? And the central question is this. Do I believe the words of Jesus? Yes. And the words of Jesus that are important to our consideration right now are this is. This is my body. This is my blood. That is the only standard we can use when deciding whether or not we are receiving the Lord's Supper with faith in his words. Not the pastor's words. Not the church body's words. Certainly not the world's words. But Jesus' words. The Son of God with power and authority to teach and to give the sacrament. He is in charge of the sacrament. Now the law, we know in my second point there, the law judges. We judge ourselves according to that standard. Just as I, when I am driving, I judge my speed, 30, according to the standard that is by the side of the road, 25. And I, I know that I am guilty of an infraction of the law. I am guilty of not discerning the body if I don't believe that it is present and received. Are you getting my analogy? So what we should we do when we find ourselves missing the mark, not believing according to Jesus' words? Now, Jesus' words are pure gospel. When he says, this is my body, that's not a law. That's a statement of truth. And he requires all hearts to believe. But it's all gospel. When we judge ourselves according to that, we're bringing in the law as a judgment against anyone who would receive without believing his words. That is, the the communicant that believes Jesus' words, there's no law. But the communicant that does not believe is judged. So what we should do is judge ourselves and repent and believe. Then we would not be judged by the Lord. We would not be condemned by the Lord in the end when all hearts are judged according to his standard. Now, I'm going to stop because I gave you a big mouthful of words, most of them abstract. Please talk about this. Ask, if you will. A lot of it goes back to uh, our teaching and bringing up uh, by our parents or our pastors through confirmation or education and Sunday school and Bible study that we know and learn the difference between 
basically right and wrong. And when we know the difference between right and wrong, these questions do not become as difficult to answer. Okay, you, you're talking again about a standard, right and wrong, mm -hmm. according to the Lord. And what's we, right about the Lord's Supper? Is that we, we believe that the words uh, of Jesus like this is, is what it is, just yeah. as it said. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you, Judy. I believe that when Jesus said, um, I uh, give you my body and my blood for the forgiveness of sins, mm -hmm. I believe that. And, and that's why I go to communion. Okay. You're thinking of the promise that's embedded in those words. All right. So if the devil or your flesh ever comes, and by flesh in this case, I mean the part of your brain that wants to question everything. <laughs> we, <laughs> we live in a rationalistic world mm -hmm. that is uh, anti, it's anti-spiritual. And uh, that part of our flesh sometimes joins in that awful chorus. I don't know what that hymn sounds like. I don't want to know. Okay, we're going to go on. And, and if you have questions later, you'll have plenty of time. Now, what Martin Luther did is write 20 questions that you can use uh, before you go to the sacrament. And as I mentioned last week, you can look them over on Sunday morning, and I'm going to tell you that it's on page 331. And it's a wonderful way that, uh, that the Synod in the Publication House, uh, CPH, organized the Lutheran service book. They made it so him. 331 is the first hymn instead of hymn one. And that why the pastors don't have to say in the front part of the hymnal anymore. Uh, that's not an essential statement here yet. But I want you to know that the 20 questions I'm talking about, you have find them by going to the first hymn, which your eyes can find. And then going back one page to page 329, where the questions are written. And if you like, I can send you a copy of those questions. Please do. But I want you to also see what I've got here on the bottom of the screen. Catechismcph.org, English, E-N, that's E-N, questions-answers.html. You know that I send you these slides every week, right? Yeah. So you can take this line here, just this line, and paste that into your the little empty URL in the top of your search, uh, oh, home screen, search engine, whatever. You can put that in there, and you'll get those 10 questions. Okay. But I found a copy this morning. Uh, I found a copy this morning. Yes, we're all here again. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Now, when you talk about the Lutheran service hymnal, is that the red hymnal? The one that's in the pew. Okay, that must because I have an old blue one and it doesn't. Not. In I have an old blue hymnal. It, it, and it, it does it doesn't match your um no. your pages. No, no. It's it's the one that we've been using since two thousand and six. I think, I think that's the red one. Yeah. Um so yeah. You, you can look at one not in there. Oh. Well the yeah, the hymnals aren't in the pews right now because of COVID. So Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. They I've they been, have, I've taken, been there for a year. Yeah, no, yeah, they've they've taken everything out of the pews. Right. I have my own hymnal. I have it here. 329. Okay. Well, I'll go back. No, that's not. Uh, that's not what I want. Let me go look at mine. I get where mine is. 
it's here somewhere. Let me get. So there we are back to back to where we left off. All right. So the self-examination in summary has just a few questions. Have I kept God's law? No, these I have not kept. And you can go into detail if your heart knows of any at the moment. Do I believe that God forgives my sin because Jesus shed his blood for me? And I think all of you, and I hope every communicant, will always answer this with a resounding yes. Yes. And number three, do I believe that I receive the true body and blood of Jesus in this sacrament? Yes. Ask not how this takes place. Just receive the way you do all things regarding faith. Not with the mind, but with the heart. And then go joyfully to receive the true body and blood of Jesus Christ in the sacrament he gives you. You see, it's all gospel. Okay, it's not okay. in there. If you don't think of any other questions, these three are central. All right. All right. Now, this is what Luther said in the small catechism. Some of you might remember this because you had to memorize it. <laughs> I know what happens to memory. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I, know, I know people have great memories, but no, no one remembers everything. <laughs> Realize what a curse it would be if you remembered everything. Yes. Something is better. Some things it's better that we uh, forget. Some things are trivia. All right. Now, what did Luther say? Fasting and bodily preparation are indeed a fine outward training. But he is truly worthy and well prepared who has faith in these words given and shed for you for the remission of sins. But he that does not believe these words or doubts or doubts is unworthy un and unprepared for the words for you require all hearts to believe. I want to reflect on, on uh, Martin Luther's words. When you were taught to receive the Lord's Supper, did uh, you or your family or your pastor advise you regarding fasting on Sunday morning before you came? No. Uh, I was not, I was not told was to do that. No. Let me tell you, it's not required by Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John when Jesus has the words of institution, and it's not required in St. Paul's words. Now, somebody is probably going to study. Hmm. I just thought of this. Whether fasting was required before receiving uh, what Moses was commanded in Exodus 12 to give the people. And what was that called? What were Jesus and his apostles celebrating on the night in which he was betrayed in the upper room? Passover. Passover. The Passover. Yeah, the cast. Somebody is going to go and look up the Passover supper and find um, a requirement fast for fasting. And I can't remember that th th this morning. Ah, oh, it just kind of lingers as a small. Anybody remember? Well, you scholars go and look that up. You know, <laughs> I don't know everything. Now, I'm going to pause again for your questions. Because I'm slowing this down. What is sometimes given in an hour or less, we're taking, this is the fourth uh, study, and I have at least one more after today on the Lord's Supper. But I want to slow down, and this, this is a chance for you to uh, 
Pastor, I've always wondered what? You're safe here. Um, you know, I think you had the statement there, we should joyfully receive the, the supper. Um, I can remember a pastor telling us a story about uh, a young uh, confirmant that wanted to know why people always look so solemn when they were receiving the Lord's Supper, that it was such a wonderful uh, occasion that why didn't people look more joyful? Or the term was even, I think he even used, she wanted to, after receiving uh, the Lord's Supper, dance, uh, <laughs> dance uh, uh, as she left the altar. And in dancing, I mean, they did do uh, altar dancing back in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the days of the biblical, um, uh, biblical days, yeah. which, was, which was a worship, a worship type of dancing, which is very, very beautiful. And some churches still do that and honor the Lord also today. But I always wondered why, why we look so almost sad because it is such a joyful occasion really for a Christian. Well, in, in the Jewish uh, faith, they dance too, a lot, very joyfully. Uh, people express joys in many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to, I'm going to be two-faced here. <laughs> uh, uh, part of me is, is, is so serious. Yes. And it wants to say, this is serious business. I'm reverent. I am uh, I'm internally joyful, but right now I'm expressing, and I was told that too. To be humi uh, humility. In 1957, I was told that same thing, uh, that you should not be um, dancing. <laughs> oh, outwardly, yeah, outwardly showing. But, but in, uh, you know, as faith matures, it, mm -hmm. it knows uh, of its freedoms. Mm -hmm. And I have the freedom to reflect with seriousness as I leave the Lord's Supper and uh, look um, not mournfully, but just serious. And But I have the freedom to go joyfully from the sacrament. I've been forgiven. Amen. Yes. I want to shout it. <laughs> and here's, I love the hymns, you know that. So I often reflect on a, a word or a phrase uh, or a, a hymn stanza. Uh, that's part of my preparation. If I have time, um, the congregation might be singing another hymn or a soloist might be singing, but I, I've got some private work to do here and I'm going to look at a, uh, a hymn on communion or on confession and absolution. Right, and I, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to spend some time <laughs> with my Lord privately, and there's joy in that too. There is joy in forgiveness. Remember, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. <laughs> right, and I can laugh with a holy laughter. There is such a thing, you know, but we're not going to go into that. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for your comments, Judy. Yeah, well, I guess I guess that's why sometimes Lutherans, Missouri Synod Lutherans, are called the frozen chosen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the man in Minnesota, you'll remind me of his. Yes, name. that's the mid. That's a Midwestern term. <laughs> the man in Minnesota uh, that tells that told stories. Uh, What's his name? Uh, he said. Oh, that, uh, Garrison Keeler. Yes, he he said if you're a Missouri Senate Lutheran, every week is Lent. <laughs> so, uh, here's something um, more serious. <clears throat> How would you describe this man's um, demeanor? Hmm. Meditative. All right. Intense. Intense. I almost get a little questioning there. I don't know if I'm reading that into it. I'm reading into it because I went looking. Oh. I, I, I have fun, you know, I have fun. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen the individual's eyes. Sometimes yeah. the eyes tell 
I didn't okay. cut those off. That was the way it was given. You see, I, I go to images.google.com <laughs> and, um, and I spend sometimes 20 minutes looking for just the right clip art to go with my question. You see, you didn't know what the question was until I popped it on there. What if I don't feel worthy? Do you see that pensive question? Yeah. Serious yes. question? Uh, that could be someone in the pew about mm -hmm. five minutes before <laughs> communion while the offering is being received. I mean, on a regular church service, not during COVID. Okay. Uh, what if I don't feel worthy? And there's a weasel word in there. And the word is feel. And sometime I'll tell you what I think about feelings. Uh, but <laughs> uh, what if I don't feel worthy? What about these feelings? Feelings are not are not an accurate barometer of my faith. Okay. <clears throat> They're not an accurate measure of my faith. I can be feeling pretty bad, but it might be good that I'm feeling bad about my sin. You see how feelings get... Mm. It's not about my lack of faith in Jesus. I'm just feeling repentant uh there's a better word there can't find it um morose no that's not the right, right word i am regretting my sin you see that man could be regretting his sin it's not a feeling although feelings come from that i think well with the, the song we feel heavy laden I um, you feel like you have a burden on your shoulders. Yes, so, you do. Wait, but, he has, but he has lifted it. Mm -hmm. You you go and look up Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. <laughs> I want to talk about faith, not feelings. Faith is definite. It has content. It has been given by God's word. And so there's no there's no doubt about what God's word is. The question is, do I have faith in his word? Well, there's no feeling in that. There's a fact. You understand the difference between feelings and faith? Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. So what if I don't feel worthy? Well, I love the large catechism because it goes into depth about every one of the subjects we talk about, about the law and the creed and about prayer specifically the lord's prayer and about baptism and the lord's supper mm -hmm. and also in another place about confession and absolution so if i want to know something a little bit more than i got in teenage <laughs> catechism or adult catechism i go to the large catechism and you can do that too and i put on the screen well, I don't have a whiteboard this morning, so I, I would have written this on the board, and I've done that many times. And some mm -hmm. of you wrote it down, and you looked it up, bookofconcord.org. And you're going to get this in your email. Okay. And you can put that in your URL box, bookofconcord, no spaces, dot org, and you'll get the complete Book of Concord. <laughs> And if you read that the rest of your life, I just I wonder if you'll ever finish it. Well, look at the large catechism and look at paragraph 61 to 72 in particular, where Martin Luther discusses the worthiness idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what if I don't feel worthy? So it's, uh, can, uh, can you read all the way down to the bottom, uh, Evelyn? Yes. Okay, I'd ask you to read this paragraph. Martin Luther, oh, Martin Luther writes, therefore such people must learn that it is the highest art to know that our sacrament does not depend upon our worthiness. For we are not baptized because we are worthy and holy, nor do we go to confession because we are pure and without sin, but the contrary, because we are poor, miserable men, and just because we are unworthy, unless it be someone who desires no grace and absolution, nor intends to reform. 
Oh. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> our sac the sacrament does not depend upon our worthiness. All right, another paragraph uh, to read. I <clears throat> want another reader. Uh, who is that? Oh. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. But uh, what if you don't feel worthy? But whoever would gladly obtain grace and consolation should impel himself and allow no one to frighten him away, but say, I indeed would like to be worthy, but I come not upon any worthiness, but upon thy word, because thou hast commanded it, and as one who would gladly be thy disciple, no matter what becomes of my worthiness. Page 62. All right. That's a lot of words to swallow. But again, it doesn't depend on my worthiness. Mm -hmm. But the objective word. Luther says in a place nearby, God will not lie to you. All right. Another reader, uh, please. D. Okay. I'll read. We must never regard the sacrament as something injurious from which we had better flee, but as pure, wholesome, comfort, comforting remedy imparting salvation and comfort, which will cure, cure you and give you life both in soul and body. For where the soul has, reco has recovered, the body also is relieved. Martin Luther. Very good. This is very positive. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I don't think <laughs> you have had that problem. All right. And one <clears throat> more paragraph. Who hasn't read? Everybody that wants to read has read. Okay, I'll, I'll go back. All right. Uh, what if I don't feel worthy, but those who are sensible of their weakness desire to be rid of it and long for help, should regard and use it only as a precious antidote against the poison which they have in them. For here in the sacrament you are to receive from the lips of Christ forgiveness of sin, which contains and brings with it the grace of God and the spirit with all his gifts, protection, shelter, and power against death and the devil and all misfortune. Hmm. That's powerful. It is. You'll have a chance to reflect on these words more confidently and slowly and meditatively when it comes to you. I'm going to stop here because believe it or not, we're already up to 53 minutes and I promise to to keep it at 55. And I have, I have had a great deal of joy in working with you to give you something a little more... Um, thoroughly and deeper than you probably had it in catechism. And I want this for you. I want as a pastor, my pastor's heart is to have you value the sacrament. Lord Jesus Christ, you've given us in your supper something we can't get anywhere else. And we thank you for that wonderful collection of blessings the chief of which is the forgiveness of sins. For when, dear Jesus, you said, this is my body, this is my blood, then you went to the cross and gave your body into death and shed your blood to cover our sins with, with that holy, precious blood and to give us something we can find nowhere else. Help us to come to you as patients come to their doctor, receiving yeah. healing and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. That is your name above all names. And in your name we pray. And God's people all said, yeah. Amen. Yeah.